So we've been using thermodynamics to look at open systems. And I've been making the argument that the steps that we generally want to follow for open systems are number one, draw your control volume. Number two, perform conservation of mass. Then do conservation of energy. And when we're doing conservation of energy, I'm going to tell you, start with the whole version of the first law and then cross terms out as you make simplifying assumptions. So we've been looking at how to do that for different processes. We know that conservation of mass looks like this. We know that the rate that mass is stored in our system is equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates coming in minus the sum of all the mass flow rates going out. For conservation of energy, our equation is longer, but we know that the energy, the rate that energy is being stored in the system is equal to the rate that heat is transferred in minus the rate of work leaving the system multiplied by all the different energy terms coming in at all the different inlets minus all the different energy terms going out at all the different outlets. Now the energy terms that we're concerned with are specific enthalpy, kinetic energy, and gravitational potential energy. So we look at the differences between these terms between the inlets and the outlets. We also know that life gets a little more difficult when we start to deal with imperial units. So even in metric units, the kinetic energy and potential energy terms, if we stick around, are going to be a problem because typically we'll get joules per second instead of kilojoules per second, which we'd get by looking up enthalpy in the textbook. Now, in imperial units, it's even worse because first we have to remember to divide by GC. Remember, that's like an acceleration of gravity here on Earth, but it's got some extra funny units so that we can get rid of pounds mass and put in pounds force. But then, even after we do this, we're going to get a unit like maybe foot pounds per second. So we'll have to turn that foot pounds into BTU by dividing by 778. And we do that because when we look up enthalpy in the textbook, the specific enthalpy will be in BTU per pound mass. So we know we have this equation. Right. So now you're going to we're going to be approaching this uh, state where you know how to do open systems and closed systems with the first law. We remember the closed version of the first law. Typically, we'll talk about elapsed time where the change in energy in the system is equal to the heat in minus the work out. We can find the work by the integral of PDV. We find delta U as M times delta specific internal energy. And then we use the first law to find the heat transfer. But in order to find the change in specific internal energy, we need to know what's the fluid. If the fluid is water, then we need to know what the phase is. And if the fluid is an ideal gas, then we have to know how are we going to model the specific heats? Are we going to say that they're constant or are we going to say that they're variable? If it's an open system, we have a, we have a different process. Now, because it's an open system, that means mass can come in and out. So we need to know what happens to the mass. We need to know what happens to the energy, right? So the energy is this first law that we just talked about where we need to find the heat in and the work out, right? Now, oftentimes in an open system, we'll say that one of these two terms is zero. So often it's a simple system where either the purpose of the component is like a turbine and it's supposed to generate power or it's a heat exchanger where we're adding heat in or removing heat. Right? But still, we're going to get to this point where we need to fix a state, where we need to know something now about the specific enthalpy instead of the specific internal energy. But we have to still ask the same questions. What's the fluid? Is it water? If it's water, what's the phase? If it's ideal gas, is it constant specific heat or variable specific heat? So this is kind of the flow chart for every problem you're going to do in thermodynamics. And if we start moving through this process and we treat every problem the same, I think you'll have a good process for answering questions and good processes lead to good answers most of the time. So we talked about why are we doing this, right? We're trying to understand these processes, which are like little pieces of Lego. And we're going to put those pieces of Lego together to make cool stuff, right? Things like this is an internal combustion engine. We're going to talk about jet engines. We're going to talk about power plants like nuclear power plants. And we're going to talk about air conditioners. 
Now, these different cycles that we use, right, which a cycle is like a series of processes where the end state of the last process is the same as the initial state of the first process. So you just keep running them over and over and over again, right? Now, we need to know open systems and we need to know closed systems because we can characterize these different cycles different ways, right? And one of the ways that we can characterize these different cycles is we think, okay, what's going to happen to the mass? Now, this isn't strictly true for internal combustion engines, but you'll see that we'll model internal combustion engines all the time as closed systems, whereas the rest of these cycles we will model as open systems. Another way we can characterize these cycles is what's the working fluid. Remember, this is important for how we find specific internal energy or how we find specific enthalpy. So ideal gases are working fluids in internal combustion engines and in jet engines. And we have some fluid that looks like water in that it has a phase change. We're moving back and forth across the vapor dome. If we're talking about a nuclear power plant or a coal-fired power plant or a refrigerator or an air conditioner. Although refrigerators and air conditioners, the working fluid isn't actually water. It's some type of refrigerant, but it acts like water because we're near the vapor dome. Another way that we can sort of characterize these systems is what's the ultimate point, right? And this will start to make sense as we move further down in the class. But what the point of these systems is either to take heat and turn it into power, Right? So all of these things, internal combustion engine, jet engine, nuclear power plant, they're all heat engines. Right? We have some heat source, usually by burning things, and we turn that heat into usable mechanical energy. But then we have something like an air conditioner, and it's kind of like running in reverse where we're putting usable mechanical energy in. Right? So we're running something like a compressor, and we're using that to transfer heat in the direction that it wouldn't normally want to go. So this is lecture 17, where we'll do some control volume analysis examples, specifically for pumps and for heat exchangers. Now, each one of these different components kind of ends up having a little bit of a trick to it. So try to pay attention here, because we'll see, especially with pumps, there's kind of a special way that we do this that's different than what we do for other processes. So here I have a pump. Right? So pumps deal with liquids. They increase the pressure of liquids. And that's exactly what we see here. So we start at state 1 with a pressure of 0.1 megapascals, quality of 0, so this is liquid water, and a mass flow rate of 10 kilograms per minute. The pump increases the pressure to 0.6 megapascals. Right? And we don't know what the temperature is at state 2. So we're asked to find the power that this pump consumes, right? So these pumps, you have to plug them into the wall and that's what you get that electrical energy, which you're turning then into mechanical energy, which is this spinning shaft. And the spinning shaft is what pressurizes or increases the pressure of the liquid that's running through the pump. So here I'm going to draw a state and a process table. So on my state table, I see that at state one, I know the pressure and I know the quality. So I'm going to assume that this is a saturated liquid at one mega or 0.1 megapascal or one bar. And then I know that I increase the pressure to 0.6 megapascals, but I don't have another piece of information there, right? I'm told that I don't know the temperature. Then I'm also going to track the process table here where we know that there's some amount of heat transfer that happens in this process. And there's some rate of work from this process too. Now I know that this is a pump, right? In a pump, work is going in to the pump. So I'm expecting the power here to be negative because the pump is consuming power. So what do we need to do? My first step in my process is to draw the control volume, right? So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to draw this dotted or dashed red line that's going to be my control volume. So here, my control volume kind of follows the walls of the pump where there's an impermeable wall. And then it has a permeable part over here where water is coming in and another permeable part over here where water is going out. Now I got to ask myself, what happens to the mass? I know that the rate that mass is stored in the system is equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates in minus the sum of all the mass flow rates out. Now the nice thing about this pump is that first we're going to assume that the system is at steady state. It's been running for a long enough time that it's kind of um, warmed up, 
right? So everything is at a constant value. And if everything is at a constant value, that means the amount of mass that's in my system is at a constant value with time. So the rate at which mass is being stored in my system, dm by dt, is equal to zero. Now, I also have only one inlet and one outlet in my system, so these summation signs go away. So if the summation signs go away, then I just know that mass in minus mass out is equal to zero, or that the mass in is equal to the mass out. So the mass flow rate in is the same as the mass flow rate out. So now, the problem maybe talks about m.1 and m.2, but they're the same mass flow rate because it doesn't change. So I'm just going to get rid of the subscripts here. And instead of having mass flow rate 1 and mass flow rate 2, I'm just going to have one mass flow rate. And the problem tells me that that's 10 kilograms per minute. Maybe my spidey sense starts tingling here because I don't particularly like when the unit of time is not seconds. So eventually I'll have to convert this. Next, I'm going to do conservation of energy because that's the next thing on my three-step process here. So what are my relevant assumptions for this pump? First, I'm going to say that the system is at steady state. So if the system is at steady state, we already said this for the mass flow rates, right? So because we're at steady state, the mass in the system stays constant with time, but everything stays constant with time. So the energy in the system also stays constant with time. So that means that my DE by DD term goes to zero. Second, I'm going to assume that the change in kinetic energy is negligible compared to the change in the specific enthalpy. We kind of saw this as an example when we dealt with the turbine in the last class. Oops, I crossed the wrong one out here. We're also going to assume that the change in potential energy is equal to zero. So that's crossed out. We'll also cross out the change in kinetic energy. We're almost done here, right? So here, the one thing that we got to remember is what's the purpose? So we don't have enough information to find both the rate of heat transfer and the rate of work. So I got to think about my component here. My component is a pump. The purpose of this pump is to take mechanical work and increase the enthalpy by way of pressure in the system. So I'm going to assume that the heat transfer, the heat loss from this pump, is really small compared to the amount of power that it consumes. So it's not really that my rate of heat transfer here is zero. It's that I just assume that it's small compared to the power that's consumed by this pump. So I am going to cross out this rate of heat transfer term. So now I get sort of the equation that I expect here, right? So here, because conservation of mass is the same, so now I put together my conservation of energy and my conservation of mass equations, and I get that the power consumed by the pump is equal to the mass flow rate times H in minus H out. Right? Remember, it's the dwarves. This is hi-ho. But remember, we're also trusting in the first law. So we're assuming that here, H in is, le is less than H out. So we're expecting this power term to ultimately be negative. So now we have a symbolic solution. And symbolic solutions are great because they demonstrate that we understand from first principles how to go from the theory to get an equation. It's also nice because... I could use this same equation for any pump that I apply these same assumptions to. But I want to get an actual answer here. So I don't have the power. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I do have the mass flow rate, but I don't have either of the specific enthalpies. This is ultimately what happens in most thermodynamic problems that we'll see in this class. We'll end up with an equation where we could get the thing that we want if we could only fix the states. So how do we find H1 and H2? So I'm telling you, whenever you get to this point, you got to ask yourself, what's the fluid, right? And in this case, the fluid is water, right? And we're told enough information. So 0.1 megapascals, that's one bar. So this is my TV diagram. I know on TV diagrams, constant pressure lines move up left to right, but are flat under the vapor dome. So here, my first state I can fix this state. State one is quality equal to zero. So it's a saturated liquid at this pressure, right? So I can put state point one here on my diagram. I can, I know that the pressure increases. So as the pressure increases, this line slides up because pressure is going up and I'm going to be somewhere on this line. 
But, like we said when we looked at the state table, I don't have two independent intensive properties for the pressure. So I can't figure out how to do this problem because I can't find the one state. But I can find state one. So let's find state one first. Here, uh, this again, this is a table that's from the FE handbook. I know H1 at a pressure of 0.1 megapascals. So I look at a table that's for saturated liquids and saturated vapors and mixtures, right? I find one bar, which is the same as one as 0.1 megapascals. And I find HF. HF is 417.4 kilojoules per kilogram. Here, my temperature is 99.62 degrees Celsius. So I can get my specific volume here too, right? So it's not actually in my equation, but we're going to see that there's a trick we can use. So I'm going to look this up now, right? And just like in the textbook, this, this value has been multiplied by 1,000. So to get to the real value, I have to divide by 1,000. So I'm going to put all that information into my state table. But it doesn't really help me that much because I don't know what's going on at state two. There's no way for me to fix the state without making an assumption. So we don't know T2, right? So I'm going to assume that state two is some saturated liquid. The problem here is we still don't know in enough information to fix state two. I know the pressure, but I don't have another piece of information. I'm going to assume that this is a subcooled liquid. But if it's a subcooled liquid and I don't know T2, what do I do? Right? So I could make the assumption that the pump is ideal. I don't know exactly know what that means yet. But here I'm going to say that, okay, if it's this ideal kind of pump, then maybe there's no increase in temperature across the pump. Right? So then I could say that the temperature is the same as the temperature in. And maybe that'll help me. So this is good because now I look at this and I see that I have two properties. And if this is a subcooled liquid, these would be independent intensive properties. But you might be looking at this and you say like, well, this is not a great assumption for us to make because I remember that uh, H of some subcooled liquid is approximately equal to HF of the liquid at the same temperature. Right? And if these two things are the same temperature, then my delta H term is just going to be zero, and that doesn't help me. Right? And that's, I mean, it's true, right? But it's also, it's an assumption. Right? So it's not a perfect way to go. So we know that the pump doesn't consume zero power, right? Because that would mean we don't have to plug it into the wall. So assuming this temperature and fixing the state like we normally would won't help us. So we have to do a little bit of trickery here, a little bit of sleight of hand. So how are we going to do that? We know that work, or power in this case, is m dot times h1 minus h2. We also know that the definition of h, specific enthalpy, is specific internal energy plus pressure times specific volume. So I can put this equation, the definition for h, I can put back into my equation for power. And I'm going to get this, right? So that the power consumed by the pump is the mass flow rate multiplied by U1 plus P1V1 minus U2 minus P2V2. Now I'm going to use the information that the temperatures are the same. So now if I know the temperature and the specific volume, and if the volume is approximately constant and the temperature is approximately constant, then U1 is going to be the same as U2, right? As a first approximation, this is also true for H, but then we get that the pump consumes zero power. So I'm going to make this assumption, and this is a better assumption if the volume, specific volume stays constant. And here, the specific volume doesn't change too much. Remember, the specific volumes of liquids, in particularly liquid water, is always right around 1 over 1,000, but it does change a little bit, right? So here, I'm going to say that the specific internal energies are equal in state one and state two. So they're going to cancel out. So then I'm going to get from my work for my pump is going to be the mass flow rate multiplied by the pressure at one times the specific volume at one minus the pressure at two times the specific volume at two. Okay, so what do I do next? For subcooled liquids, like we just said, well, what if the specific volumes are about the same, right? So we have enough information because we can't find the specific volume at two, 
without the information of specific volume at two, right? We don't have two independent intensive properties at state two. Maybe I could do some kind of double interpolation by assuming that the temperature is about the same, but it's a lot of work to eventually find out that the specific volume is going to be basically the same as the specific volume at one, right? So now I'm going to say that the specific volume at two is equal to the specific volume at one. So if this became little v one, then I could take the little v's out and I could say the power consumed by the pump is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by the specific volume, which is the same approximately at the inlet and outlet times the change in pressure. Okay, let's check this out, right? Let's do the math. So now I have an equation for the power consumed by a pump, right? I know the pressure at state one. I know the pressure at state two, and I know the specific volume at state one. So if I assume the specific volumes at state one and state two are about the same, then I can get an answer. I know everything except the power consumed by my pump. So this is going to be 10 kilograms per minute. Notice I haven't changed this yet. I think if I was doing this on an exam, I would try to change everything right at the beginning. I have a specific volume for my fluid at the inlet and approximately the same at the outlet. And then I have the change in pressure. Notice here that I also changed my pressure to kilopascals because if I ever want to add this to find like network and I'm looking up ages in the textbook, it's going to be in kilojoules per kilogram. So I'm going to get something in kilojoules. So actually, usually when I make a state table, I try to turn the pressure into kilopascals right away because then I'm already doing my unit conversion when I'm filling in my state table and then I'll get the units that I want, right? So now I've done the unit conversion here. The good thing here is that this is going to be 100 minus 600, right? 600 is bigger than 100 and these are both positive values. So the power consumed by the pump is going to be negative. And that's good because it should be negative because the power consumed by the pump should be negative because work is coming into my system. And I know from my sign convention that work in is negative. So here I'm going to do the math. If I multiply all this out, I get negative 5.2, but my units are meters cubed, kilopascals per minute. That's not super useful, right? So now I got to work on my unit conversion. So I got this weird unit, meters cubed kilopascals per minute kilogram. I'm going to multiply by, I know one minute is 60 seconds and I want to get rid of the minutes in the denominator here. So this one will get the minutes to cancel out. And then I'll be left with kilonewton meters per seconds which kilonewton meters is the same as kilojoules. So the minutes are going to drop out. So now I'm going to get kilowatts. But here I had to divide this number by 60 and I get that the power consumed by my pump is negative 0.09 kilowatts. And one of the reasons we like to use pumps in things like nuclear power plants and in um, coal-fired power plants is that it takes comparatively little energy to increase the pressure of a liquid compared to increasing the pressure of a gas. So it's easier for us to pump up a liquid than it is to pump up a compressible fluid like gas. So that's how we deal with pumps. I also today would like to go over how we deal with heat exchangers. So this is a shell and tube heat exchanger. So we have one fluid, a refrigerant, going through this tube. We're told this is R134A. There are different kinds of refrigerants. Our friends in chemical engineering are always working on new formulations of refrigerants that end up being more environmentally friendly. So here, this is R134A. It's going to pass through this tube back and forth, right? But it starts off at 5 bar and some quality of 0.2, and it ends up at 5 bar and 20 degrees Celsius. So there's some process going on here. We have air going through the other side of our heat exchanger. So the air and the refrigerant never actually touch each other. But this air, which comes in at 32 degrees Celsius, and it has some volumetric flow rate, it's going through our system and it interacts with the outside of these tubes. So then there's heat transfer across there. And we go from 32 degrees Celsius up or down to 22 degrees Celsius. So this refrigerant is cooling down our air, which means the refrigerant must be accepting heat, right? So the refrigerant must be heating up. 
So we're asked here to find the mass flow rate of R134A, and we're also asked to find the heat transfer from the air to the 134A, to the refrigerant. So how do we do this? Okay, so now our system has two inlets and two outlets. It has an inlet for air and an inlet for refrigeration for the refrigerant, and it has an outlet for the air and an outlet for the refrigerant. I take down all the information I know, and I'm a little bit encouraged here because I have two state points or two pieces of information for each state point. So I'm hopeful that I'll be able to fix all of these states. So again, I want to draw, I want to go through my same process that I'm going to go through for all of these open systems. First, I'm going to draw my control volume. And we've got a couple of different choices here. So first, we can draw a control volume across the entire heat exchanger. So this includes the hot side of the heat exchanger and the cold side of the heat exchanger. I can draw just the air side. So I've tried to black out the tubes. So if I do just the air side, I only have one inlet, the inlet of the air, and only one outlet, the outlet of the air. So now I'm only going to look at the air side of the heat exchanger. My third choice is to only look at the tube that the refrigerant is flowing through. So if I did this, I would only have one inlet for the refrigerant and one outlet for the refrigerant. And you'll see there's advantages and disadvantages of doing all three of these control volumes, and we may have to do them all to solve the problem. So we'll start with the whole device. So we'll start looking at the whole heat exchanger with two inlets and two outlets. We're gonna do conservation of mass here. So conservation of mass tells us that the amount of mass stored in the system is equal to the sum of all the masses in, mass flow rates in, minus the sum of all the mass flow rates out. We're going to assume that this is at steady state. And if that's true, I'll collect these terms by their uh, state type or by their fluid type. So I'll have an inlet air mass flow rate and an outlet air mass flow rate and the same with the refrigerant. So here, because the air and the refrigerant don't mix, what ends up happening is that I'm going to find that for the refrigerant, the, ma the mass flow rate in of the refrigerant is equal to the mass flow rate out of the refrigerant. And for the air, the mass flow rate in of the refrigerant is going to be equal to the mass flow rate out of the refrigerant. This may have been more apparent if I started off just looking at either the air side or the refrigerant side, but I would come to the same conclusion. Because the the streams of mass don't cross, all the refrigerant that comes out has to be the same as all the refrigerant that goes in if I'm at steady state, and the same thing's true for the air. So I really only have one mass flow rate for air and one mass flow rate for the refrigerant. I could have done the same thing with two different control volumes, and I would have got the same answer, and maybe I would have gotten it more directly, because here this is at steady state, so this would be dm by dt goes to zero, the mass flow rate in of the air minus the mass flow rate out of the air is equal to zero, and the same thing true for the refrigerant. So I would have gone to the same conclusion if I drew the whole control volume or if I only drew each half of the control volume. Now, this is not surprising because these things exist in the same universe and the answer I get shouldn't depend on how I draw my control volume, right? So this is the same no matter which way I do it. So conservation of mass tells us that there's one mass flow rate for air and one mass flow rate for the refrigerant. Now we've got to do conservation of energy, right? So again, we'll start with the whole device. So if we start with the whole device, we're going to be at steady state. This is almost always true in this class. We're going to say that for sure, because the purpose of this particular component is to transfer heat, and there's no fan blades inside my system anywhere, we're going to say that the power consumption here is equal to zero, so that there's no, it's passive, or that there's no work term. We're going to neglect changes in gravitational potential energy and changes in kinetic energy. And then here's the weird part. We're going to assume that this whole heat exchanger is well insulated. So what this means is that it's okay to transfer heat from the air to the refrigerant, but that none of the heat from the system leaves the heat exchanger. So all the heat that comes from the air goes into the refrigerant. 
So after all my assumptions, this is the version of the first law that I get, that zero is equal to the sum of all the mass flow rates in, multiplied by their respective specific enthalpies, minus the sum of all the mass flow rates out, multiplied by their specific enthalpies. So here, because I have an inlet term for the air, and an inlet term for the refrigerant, and an outlet term for the air, and an outlet term for the refrigerant, I can write my equation like this. Notice the inlet terms are positive and the outlet terms are negative. But since I know there's only one mass flow rate for air and one mass flow rate for, in, for refrigerants, I can group these terms by the type of fluid that they have. So here, I get that the mass flow rate for air multiplied by H1 minus H2 plus the mass flow rate for the refrigerant multiplied by H3 minus H4 is all equal to zero. So now, if I want, I can sort of put the refrigerant terms on the left-hand side of the equation and the air terms on the right-hand side of the equation. So because I move this term over to the other side, I make this a negative m dot r times h3 minus h4, right? Or if I multiply this negative one inside the brackets, I could also get m dot r times h4 minus h3, right? So that's what I get here. I get that m dot r is equal to m dot of the air times h1 minus h2 divided by h4 minus h3, right? Basically, what this equation tells us is that all the heat that comes out of the air goes into the refrigerant, right? And that comes from this idea that we've uh, perfectly insulated our heat exchanger. So this type of analysis where you do a heat exchanger and you look at the entire heat exchanger, so this type of analysis where we get a mass flow rate of one fluid as a function of the mass flow rate of the other fluid, this is um, what we get when we do the analysis of the entire system. So if you're looking for a mass flow rate through a heat exchanger, this is a good way to do it by doing conservation of energy on the entire heat exchanger. Right. So here again, we've reversed the order. This is now H out minus H in because um, we moved this over to the other side of the equation and multiply by negative one. So if I want to find the, ma the mass flow rate of the refrigerant, here I don't know the mass flow rate of the air. I don't know either of the enthalpies, H1 or H2. I don't know H3 and I don't know H4. So here, we're, it's nice because we have a symbolic solution, but we don't know really anything. We don't have any of these terms. So we need to fix states and we need to find the mass flow rate of the air. So for our 34 a our 134a we're told that the pressure is five bar and we're given a quality right so here this works just like water but we have to look at a different table instead of the two phase tables for water we got to find the two phase tables for our 134a turns out that the saturation temperature the temperature at which this fluid boils at this pressure is 15.74 degrees celsius our next state is 20 degrees Celsius. So what happens is here, our refrigerant is heating up. Remember our air was cooling down. So our refrigerant is heating up. We're moving from here to a saturated vapor. And then we move our temperature up at the same pressure. So here we go to state four, which is going to be a superheated vapor. So here I can find H at the quality that I need. This is gonna be HF plus X times HG minus HF, the same equation we would use for water, or on the tables, they're actually gonna give us HFG. So here I've taken um, from the tables at five bar, we have this saturation temperature. I know HF, I know HFG, and I know HG. So here I can uh, work all this math out and find that H of the given quality is going to be equal to 108.24 kilojoules per kilogram. So I put that into my table. This was my inlet state for the refrigerant. For the outlet state, I look for the equivalent of, I think it's table A4 for air, right? So I look for the superheated vapor tables, but it's not A4 because it's not air, it's refrigerant. So it's a different number in the table. So I got to look through the tables and find the, the right table for the right fluid. Here I know the temperature is 20 degrees, so I can read this information off. So here I know that the specific enthalpy in this case is 260.34.
if I ever need the specific volume, that's going to be in there too. So here I can take these numbers and put them into my state table. So what about the air? Right? So now I can just look at the conservation of mass over in the air. Because remember, I have got now some of my states, but I don't know the mass flow rate of air, and I don't know the change in enthalpy in the air either. Right? So I know that it's an ideal gas. So I'm going to use some assumptions um, assuming that this is an ideal gas. Right? So if it's an ideal gas, then delta H for ideal gases is going to be Cp times delta T if we assume that the specific heats are constant. So again, we ask, what's the fluid? It's air. I'm going to assume the air is an ideal gas, and then I'm going to use constant specific heats to find delta H. And that means that I never actually have to find the enthalpies. Instead, I'm just going to find the temperatures. So H1 minus H2 is going to be Cp of air multiplied by T1 minus T2. Does it matter here if I pick Kelvin or Celsius? The answer for this part is no, because anytime I have delta T, as long as I pick the same units, I can't have one in Kelvin and one in Celsius. But if they're both in Kelvin and if they're both in Celsius, I'll get the same answer, right? If you think about a thermometer and if, you know, on one side of the thermometer, you had lines for Kelvin and the other side of the thermometer, you had lines for Celsius, the difference between those lines, the distance between those lines is going to be the same. So any delta T is the same whether you're using absolute or relative temperatures. So in this case, I'm just going to use the temperature in Celsius. I know that the mass flow rate is, or I know that uh, the specific heat is one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. This is always about true for air. You can look this up in a table and maybe you find a better answer for some average temperature here. But I'm going to use one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. And I get 32 minus 22, and this gives me that delta H is 10 kilojoules per kilogram. So I'm going to put that into my table as well. So now I know all the enthalpies, or at least I know the two changes in enthalpies that I need. I don't actually know H1 or H2, um, but I know H1 minus H2, and that's good enough for this equation. So now I need to know the mass flow rate of air. So how do we find the mass flow rate of air? So I know the volumetric flow rate of air is 50 cubic meters per minute. So if I knew the specific volume of air, then I could find the mass flow rate of air. So if this is an ideal gas, then I know that I can use the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law would be P big V is equal to MRT1. But if I divide both sides by the mass, then I'd get that P little v is equal to RT1. Remember, this is the specific gas constant, so I got to find the right gas constant for air. So now I can find that the specific volume of the air at state one is equal to R, the specific gas constant, times T divided by P1. Now this temperature is not a temperature difference. Anytime you have a single temperature that stands alone in an equation, you have to use either Kelvin or Rankine if it's an imperial problem, right? So here, this one has to be in Kelvin. So the mass flow rate for air, I look up the specific gas constant for air, I multiply by my temperature in Kelvin, and I divide by the pressure, which is 100 kilopascals. So from this, I get that a specific volume is 0.875 but now this is kilonewton meters per kilogram multiplied by meters squared per kilonewton. So the kilonewtons are going to cancel, and I'm going to get meters times meters squared divided by kilogram. And that's good, right? Because what I'm trying to get, right, this is a specific volume, so I should get volume divided by mass or meters cubed per kilogram. So now I know the specific volume. I can put this into my calculation, and I get... 57.1 kilograms per minute. I'm going to write this down as kilograms per second. But if I don't convert this, that's going to be okay. It just means that my refrigerant mass flow rate would also be in kilograms per minute if I used my equation before. But I like my mass flow rates in mass per second. So I'm going to convert this 0.95 kilograms per second. So 
Now I have the mass flow rate for the air and I have all these enthalpy values. So I'm going to go through and try to find my mass flow rate of my refrigerant, right? So here I'm going to put all the information that I know into this equation, punch some things into my calculator, check out my unit. So my kilojoules are going to cancel. My kilograms are going to cancel here, right? So this is going to be kilograms cancels with kilograms over here. And I get kilograms per second. Or if you like, this kilogram here would cancel with this kilogram there, and I'd be left with kilograms per second over here. So I get a mass flow rate of 0 0.0625 kilograms per second. So this is a much slower mass flow rate than the other mass flow rate, which was, uh, I think, almost 10 times larger. So now I know the mass flow rate for air. So that's great. I know the mass flow rate for refrigerant. That's great. But the problem asks, how much heat is transferred from the air to the refrigerant? So now we're going to draw our control volume so that it's only the air, right? We're not going to think about the refrigerant. So we're going to use conservation of energy again because the first law in this class turns out to be really important to use the first law of thermodynamics in thermodynamics class. And we're going to use it more than once in this problem because we'll draw our control volume differently. Now we make different assumptions. It's still going to be at steady state. It's still going to be passive. There's going to be still no change in potential energy, no change in kinetic energy. But now we're going to say, because it's only the air side, right? So now that it's only the air side, there's only one inlet and one outlet. And this time there is going to be heat, right? So the, the heat is going to be leaving the system as we cool the air down from 32 degrees to 22 degrees. So now we get that from conservation of energy, we get this equation, that the heat rate of air plus m dot in of air minus h in of air, right? So this is m dot one h one minus m dot two h two, right? But from continuity or conservation of mass, we know that m dot in of the air is equal to m dot out of the air. So that's the same thing. So here we're going to get that q dot is equal to m dot air multiplied by h2 minus h1. So what's going to happen here is I flip these things over to the other side of my equation. And so this becomes positive and this becomes negative. So remember when we were trying to find work from the first law and we talked about the dwarves and it's being hi-ho, right? Because the dwarves work really hard. If you're trying to find heat transfer, you're going to expect, if you make these assumptions that we've made, that it's going to be the opposite of work. That for work, we get m dot times h in minus h out. For heat transfer, we're going to get m dot times h out minus h in. But you don't have to memorize all this stuff. You just have to know the process that you go through from the first law. We know the mass flow rate of air. We know that h1 minus h2 is 10. So h2 minus h1 has got to be negative 10. So I put this in and I get that q dot air to the refrigerant is negative 9.5 kilowatts. So that kind of makes sense, right? Because the, the air is losing heat, right? Heat in is positive, right? Hip. So heat out must be negative. So we get negative 9.5 kilowatts here. I can check my answer, right? Because I know from conservation of energy that if the outside of my heat exchanger is insulated, then all the heat that leaves the air must be going into the refrigerant. So you wouldn't necessarily do this on a test, but in real life, you might want to do the problem from both sides to see that you get the same answer. So we should get, when we look at the refrigerant, we should find that the heat into the refrigerant has the same magnitude as the heat out of the air, but the sign is flipped. So let's see if that happens. So we're going to look at just the tube side of our shell and tube heat exchanger. It's at steady state. It's passive. There's no change in elevation. There's no change in kinetic energy. And what we're going to get is the same equation, right? Again, we're going to find that the mass flow rates for the refrigerants are equal. So now these terms become just one mass flow rate for the refrigerant. And we get Q on the refrigerant side is M dot R times H4 minus H3. That's H out minus H in. Here we work this out. And now you'll see that H4 is bigger than H3. So this is a positive number. And it's a positive number that has the same magnitude as 
the negative number we saw when we looked at the heat transfer from the air side. So that's what we'd expect, is that we get the same magnitude, but the opposite sign. Because here on the refrigerant side, the refrigerant is accepting heat where the air was losing heat. So that shows you, hopefully, how we do conservation of mass and conservation of energy. So basically, how do we do open system analysis? We did a turbine last class, and then this class, we did a pump, and we did a heat exchanger. And we did a heat exchanger looking at the entire system and then looking at individual sides. Typically, when you look at heat exchangers, if you're trying to find a mass flow rate, you'll look at the entire system. And if you're trying to find a heat transfer rate, you'll look at one side or the other. So that's it for this lecture. Hope you have a great day, maybe a great weekend. See you next time on Thermodynamics.